So my name is Matt LeMay. I'm the platform manager at Bitly. Bitly is a link shortener nominally, but what we really do is big data. We have 8 billion clicks a month on our links. We know a lot of information about those clicks. There's a lot of cool stuff we can do. But this particular talk started for me when Facebook rolled out their timelines because it freaked me out profoundly. Um, this is data that I've known about, right? Archival data has always existed on our Facebook profiles, but suddenly having it displayed in front of me one click away from whenever anybody looks me up on Facebook immediately and profoundly unsettled me. And I started thinking, why exactly is that? And, and the answer, I think, is that the Internet is archiving things that we never sought to archive and we never had any means of archiving before. When you go to a restaurant, when you talk to someone, when somebody writes something and says, LOL, it was nice seeing you last night, these are all things that usually played out in very ephemeral, very brief social transactions. We now have an archive of that forever, which is awesome, but also kind of terrifying, because sometimes there are things in your past that you don't want to have one click away for everybody. So for example, let's say that tonight, when we all go out drinking, I get completely shit-faced, I pass out, I puke all over myself. Somebody will have a picture of that, but not only that, but thanks to a social network like Untapped, I'll be able to go back and say, what beer exactly did I drink in order to get that incredibly shit-faced that I'm passed out and puking all over myself? So this is a quote, a beautiful quote from Blaise Pascal. Time heals griefs and quarrels, for we change and are no longer the same persons. And I think this resonates with all of us, because certainly as all of us have grown up, we've looked back at the people we used to be and thought, oh my god, I can't believe I was actually that person. Um, the problem is, with the internet, that's not exactly true. As anyone who's ever designed any kind of system knows, time ain't nothing but a stamp. I can pull information from five years ago just as easily as I can pull information from five minutes ago or five seconds ago. Um, so to illustrate this point, I brought with me my, my high school diary. <laughs> this, this is full of so much shame and embarrassment, I cannot even begin. But it, it doesn't frighten me. I am no longer frightened of this book. And the reason I'm no longer frightened of this book is that it's a physical object and it's aged. I can look at this and I can say, I remember holding this when I was 16 years old and writing in it. I know that this is no longer the person I am. So for example, when I open to this page, and, um, and I, I read myself writing, I was 16 at the time when I wrote this, I just bought a Parliament Funkadelic CD. Funk is cool, but despite my best efforts, I'm not. <laughs> this really sucks. Why the fuck do I feel entitled to anything? What the fuck have I done to set myself apart from anyone? I've indulged my petty interests, fucked up almost every friendship I've had, and somehow expect romance in return. Fuck you. I wonder how you'll look back on this later. If you're looking back at this, an old, wise, romantically experienced adult, and thinking something along the lines of, man, I didn't know anything back then, well then congrats, but I don't think that will ever fucking happen. Yeah. So thank you. <laughs> so even when I was 16, I was imagining this as kind of a time capsule. I was thinking, okay, this is so tied to this moment, the physicality of this object existing is forever entwining these thoughts and this moment in this physical object. This, on the other hand, is my live journal from when I was in college. When I pull this up, it looks exactly the same now as it did then. I wrote nothing nearly as embarrassing on this as I did in that book, and yet this scares the shit out of me way more than that book does. So part of what I want to get to today is why that is, how this has changed us. I think part of the issue is that we've had social media for long enough to be embarrassed by ourselves. I remember when Facebook launched, it was like this amazing golden age when you could just say whatever you wanted. Everyone was out there talking to each other. People were very candid. People were communicating very openly. Nobody was really that concerned about their privacy because there was still this factor of novelty and you still had enough control and your social graph was new enough that you could really only converse with the people you wanted to. Now everybody wants privacy for themselves, but they want egregious oversharing from everyone else. When you go on Facebook, you want to see embarrassing pictures of everyone else and flattering pictures of yourself. Um, that's not really tenable, but people try really hard. Um, for example, on Last FM, they have a list of the most deleted Scrabbles. Scrabbles are when you share the things you've listened to. It is always Lady Gaga, it is always Katy Perry. These are the things that people listen to 
that they enjoy. And why shouldn't you share the things you enjoy? Maybe because you're afraid it will make you look like a complete moron. So this picture, I think, it should be the new emblematic picture of how we all relate to social media right now. This is a cat in a chicken suit. You are a kitty. You want to be a chicken. You are a kitty in a chicken suit. So the cat is who you are. The chicken is how you want to be seen. Is this a cat or is it a chicken? In a very real sense, it is just a cat. But in another, not quite as real sense, it is both a cat and a chicken. It's a cat in a chicken suit. So how do we articulate a cat and a chicken? How can we learn about this from Bitly? As I said, there are 8 billion clicks a month on, on Bitly links. We have data about links that are clicked and links that are shared. Links that are shared are public-facing content, stuff that people want associated with them. Stuff that people click is just stuff that interests them. Nobody knows what you personally are clicking. But we can look at this data in aggregate and see some pretty interesting stuff. So what in the world are people clicking? This is a visualization of trending keywords all around the world. This was done in real time. I took a screenshot. It's hard to tell, but right over North America, people are literally looking for a date. Um, here we'll zoom in on, the, on Europe and on Asia. And as you can see, the stuff that people are clicking on, I know you all like to claim you don't care about the monarchy, whatever. Always like 8 million Duchess Kate links totally getting click traffic from everywhere around here. Um, in Japan, topless Tuesday trooper is a trending keyword. I don't even know what that is. I did not look it up. <laughs> um, so we fired up this visualization in front of all our shareholders. We said, all right, guys, you're investing in Bitly. We want to show you that we have this amazing insight into the web, into everything that's interesting to everyone right now. So we have a whole room full of fancy rich people who are investing money in our company. They're all staring at this visualization. What is the first phrase that pops up? Touch a boob day. <laughs> Touch a boob day. Thank you, 4chan and Reddit. So we can also do some really interesting things here that more directly articulate this difference between what people share and what people click. So we can say that people who click on one thing also click other things. We can look at click co-occurrence. So here's an article on the oatmeal. If you do this in an email, I hate you. People love sharing this because the implicit message in sharing this is that I'm really fucking good at email because I know what makes everyone else really fucking bad at email. But the people who click this are also clicking on this article on OkCupid Trends about gay sex and straight sex. And they're also clicking on this twit pic of spotted dick. Again, I know that's like a thing here, but in America, we find that very funny, as do we find the fact that the train I took goes to a place called Cockfosters. Anyhow. <laughs> so the kitty is what you share. The chicken is what you click. So let's really take a look at this. We ran data for a day. We said, what do people share the most? What's going out there the most being shared by our users? The Kindle Fire, that's interesting. I know about technology. I'm smart. No, you're not going to quit Facebook. I know a lot about social media, so I'm going to share links about it on social media. Look how smart I am. Oh, look, it's, a it's an article about being likable with social media. If I'm sharing this, I must be the most likable person in the world. But what do people actually click? I'll give you a hint. It's not that. <laughs> this particular day, the preview for Real Steel, the Rock'em Sock'em Robots movie, was trending above all else, followed by a blog of people with tattoos of guns. A video of a girl singing a Britney Spears song and pouring ketchup on her head in the shower. Kelly Clarkson video premiere, which I'm sure got deleted from tons of people's last FM scrabbles at the same time. This actually pretty funny picture of a, a baby having a car accident, <laughs> which is actually pretty funny. And of course, Kim Kardashian. Our science team has now become obsessed with the idea of Kim Kardashian, even if not with the vapid persona of Kim Kardashian herself. So who's actually smarter, right? People are sharing content that makes them look smart. But is that smart? I'm going to say probably not. So if you look at the average number of clicks per the actual instances of these links being shared, and this is not the most scientific metric, so for that I apologize. These are getting a ton of clicks every time somebody shares them, right? Real Steel, Tattoos of Guns, these are getting a lot of clicks. If you look at the number of shares versus the number of clicks on the articles that make you look smart, nobody's actually clicking this shit. We get a lot of emails from people at our support address who fancy themselves social media gurus who say, I shared this really smart social media guru link to my social media guru friends. 
Your system is saying it only got 10 links, but it was retweeted 30 times. That's impossible. But it, it's actually completely possible. Because people are sharing that link without even reading it. Because they think it makes them look so smart to say, look at this article I'm sharing about how smart I am. Um, so the fact that the six ways to be likable with social media is getting clicked so little is ironic. It's, it's funny. It doesn't really add up. And why exactly is this? So as I said, I think the kitten chicken is the new canonical image of what the social web looks like now. This is the old one, right? This is this old New Yorker cartoon on the internet. Nobody knows you're a dog. This is how we used to think about identity on the, on the internet. Because before social media, we were all afraid of anonymity and we were all afraid of people misrepresenting themselves. The idea is you'd be on AOL, you know, hanging out. Somebody would pop up and say, oh, hi, I'm not a dog. And what if they are a dog? Right? The problem is, with social media, nobody really gives a shit if you're a dog. If you start a new Twitter account and you start barking into the void that you're not a dog, nobody's going to respond and nobody's going to care. Anonymity and misrepresentation are no longer really scary because this is such a fundamental part of how we interact with the web that our authentic personas have actually become a lot more interesting than the people we think we should be. When I gave this talk last time, I got some, some blowback on Twitter, people saying, so, so what, are you saying that we should just share links to Kim Kardashian all the time and never share poetry? And we should never share beautiful, edifying content? Of course not. Of course that's not what I'm saying. But the funny paradox here is that every time I, for example, point out that International Touch a Boob Day got a ton of clicks, everyone laughs. Every time I point out Tattoos with guns got more click traffic than the Kindle Fire. Everyone laughs. And then those same people will often turn around and say, blah, 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 but that's not, you, that can't be all there is to the internet. But the fact that you laugh about it says something. The fact that this entertains you says something. And I don't necessarily think that's something that we should run from. I don't think that's something much like beer, that just because it can be bad for you when you consume too much of it means that it's not innately something that we should embrace. In other words, people talk a lot about building your personal brand, and I hate that phrase. I use that phrase sometimes because I'm a hypocrite, but I hate that phrase. <laughs> because people who act like brands are assholes. We hate them. So many people on Twitter are trying so hard to tell us something about themselves, to show us how smart they are, how great they are, how much they know, who they know, that we don't get a sense of who they are. And in this social media, nobody cares if you're a dog world, that's not enough. Being generic is not enough. It's the things that are embarrassing. It's the things that you want other people to share about themselves, but you're hesitant or afraid to share about yourself that are actually going to make you who you are on the social web, that are going to take your authentic persona insofar as any of us have an authentic persona and communicate that and make that interesting to other people. In other words, the kitty is better than the chicken. So thank you very much.